Welcome to Chapter 2, or Unit 2, of the Environmental Systems and Societies course. This chapter is all about ecosystems and ecology, and we start with some information about species and populations. In this set of PowerPoints, I've started to include the significant ideas that are included in the PowerPoint in a slide at the beginning of each presentation, just so as we get more and more information. Um, you have like a recap at the beginning of exactly what uh, we're gonna go over. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is biotic and abiotic factors. And those words might be familiar to you from an introductory biology class. As a reminder, biotic means living and abiotic means non-living. So in this picture, there are lots of abiotic factors. The light is abiotic, the water is abiotic, but the abiotic factors are what makes it possible for life to happen there. So in this water, there are probably some fish. We can draw a little fish. Um, and the reason that those biotic, those living factors are able to exist there, we'll draw some birds, um, the reason that they're able to be there is because the abiotic conditions make it possible for them to survive. When we look at populations in an area, in this course it's important to describe them as specifically as possible. We've already talked a few times about the importance of using specific examples. In this picture, for example, you can give, any time that you know it, you should give the Latin name of a species. The population size is five, because there are five lions in this picture. And their specific habitat is the Zambezi National Park in Zambia. I actually took this picture on a safari about two years ago. And I know it's hard to see all of the lions. So there's one, two, three, four, and the last one is like sort of asleep over here, five. Um, and we call this the population size because these are the members of this species that are living in that specific place at that specific time. And that's how we define a population. Some other terminology that you should be familiar with is how we measure population density or the average number of individuals that are living in a stated area at a given time. You can measure that for plants. You can also measure that for animals. Um, there are three factors that affect population size and population density. Natality is birth rate. Mortality is death rate. And migration is the movement into or out of a given area. And obviously those three things have an effect on the number of organisms that live in a population at any given time. When you think about where an organism is able to live, you can talk about its niche or its niche. And there's two ways that we can discuss that. The first is the fundamental niche, which is the full range of abiotic and biotic conditions in which a species can survive. The second is the realized niche, which is where the species actually lives. And a great example of that is this Angolan reed frog. I love these frogs. But I took this picture not in Angola, but in Botswana. And that's because during the floods in the Delta in Sub-Saharan Africa, these frogs get washed out of Angola and all the way into the Okavanga Delta in Botswana. Because the conditions there support their life cycle, they're able to survive there as well. So even though they're named for the country of Angola, they don't have to live there. Their realized niche is bigger than just that. And the next thing that we are going to talk about is how population size is decided in terms of what we call limiting factors and carrying capacity. So carrying capacity, represented by this K, is the max number of species that can be sustainably supported in a given area. So a lot of times, and we'll see this on a graph in this PowerPoint, you see population size increase exponentially and then it sort of levels out around some given kind of population number. And that number, that line, is referred to as the carrying capacity, the K value of the species. The thing that decides carrying capacity, that decides this line, 
is what we call limiting factors. Limiting factors can be biotic or they can be abiotic. And if you look at this picture, that same as the very first picture that we looked at, some possible things that could limit the life, we'll put our fish back, the fish that live in this uh, lake, these are terrible fish, but you get the idea. Some things that could limit the population of fish that live in this lake are biotic things like competition and abiotic things like temperature and water pH. So you have both biotic and abiotic limiting factors at play in an environment. And we'll go on to define these in a little bit more detail. Limiting fact, biotic limiting factors like competition can take place in a couple of ways. You can have intraspecific competition between members of the same species, and you can have interspecific competition from members of different species competing to try and exist in the same niche. So for example, in this temperate deciduous woodland, Light is an abiotic limiting factor. Plant species that cannot get enough light will die out. So uh, if you have all different kinds of plants competing with tall maple and beech trees for sunlight, that would be interspecific biotic competition. And those are some of those vocabulary words that it's important to be able to use concisely and define well to better your scientific writing. When you look at biotic relationships between organisms, I hope that this is a review for you guys, but you can talk about predation, herbivory, parasitism, and mutualism as different kinds of population interactions that organisms can go through. So it's not just that species are competing. There are other ways that species can survive um, where they help each other to live in a given place. And a lot of times in ecology, those relationships are represented by a table. And we're going to take a quick look at the table now. In competition, neither species is really benefiting because they're both struggling to survive and fighting against each other. So you draw a minus sign for each species. And then if you had to think of an example of competition, it could be small flowering plants and birch trees like we had in our deciduous forest example. In predation, you have one species benefiting and another species suffering. So one is gets a plus sign and one gets a minus sign. Predation is like the relationship between wolves and moose on an island um, or coyotes and house cats in your backyard. There are a lot of different examples of predation. Parasitism is another example of a relationship where one organism benefits and another one suffers. And parasites are so interesting. There are a lot of different species of parasitic wasps and parasitic worms and parasitic bacteria. If in that previous slide you can't see, I'm going to go back, you can't see this video about parasitic wasps, you should get on Google and look up a YouTube video about parasitic wasps and how they behave because they are horrifying. Same thing with tapeworms. So if you have some extra time and you're not just cramming for your IB exams, this is a great place to get in a little bit of a YouTube hole. Um, but I digress, and we will get back to mutualism, which is a relationship where both organisms involve benefit. My favorite example of this is the example of algae and lichens to convert nitrogen in the roots of plants. Um, but you see other examples of mutualism, like uh, the most famous ones are probably in coral reefs, where you have cleaner fish existing side by side with sharks and bring predatory fish, cleaning their teeth and cleaning around their eyes so that they can hunt better. And the sharks or the big predatory fish know not to eat the cleaner fish because they understand that they're providing them a service. So those are all different ways that organisms can interact with each other. Um, but when eventually an organism hits its limit, you see that curve that we were talking about before. This line is our carrying capacity, and there's two ways that a species can sort of meet this line. The, we'll talk about J-curves first. Um, these are more likely to happen in small animals that come first to live in an environment, 
and J curve species sort of get to this line and then exist right upon it. S curve species are more likely to get to this line, they might overshoot a little bit, and then they slow down and sort of go back and forth around this carrying capacity. In reality, it's hard to classify one given species as fitting really concisely into either one of these. You're more likely to see a mix. One species that we're obviously really curious about how they're going to behave around their carrying capacity is humans, because some people think that we are overshooting our carrying capacity pretty significantly right now, and we are going to see what is called a dieback, because we are in a situation of overshoot at the current time. So you might see a die-off, and then you might see a population level out for a little while, they start to grow, they level out for a little while, they grow, they die back. So these perfect exponential mathematical curves aren't always the right model for real population growth, but it's important to know about them. And both of these population growth ideas will come back when we talk about succession. So keep those in mind. But for now, let's get going to your homework assignment. So for homework, if you're following along in the textbook, this is the wrong reading pages, but your optional reading would be 2.1 in the Oxford Press. I'm going to change that right now. 2.1 in your Oxford Press book. Um, and that's not pages, that's section 2.1 in the Oxford Press textbook. And then the thing that you should definitely do, even if you're not following along in the book, is this writing practice activity. So I want you to look back over the information in this PowerPoint and discuss two abiotic limiting factors present in a specific named population of organisms. So remember, this is your example to give a specific named population of organisms. Make sure that you do that as succinctly and concisely as possible. Um, you can do research on the internet if you want. You can look through the information in this PowerPoint if you want. When you think you have a good answer, move on to the review video for 2.1, and I will see you there.